Welcome to another episode of United for a Healthy Stoughton. My name is Stephanie Patton and I'm the prevention coordinator for the town. And today we're gonna to be talking about medication safety here in Stoughton. So here with me in the studio today, I have Todd Brown, who is a pharmacist. He has been on our coalition for a very long time um, here in Stoughton. And he's also on the faculty at Northeastern University. So welcome Todd, back to the show. Thank you. So Todd has been with us on a number of shows actually to talk about medication safety. And we thought that it was time for a refresher because it's so important. Um, and so I thought actually it might be fun to talk a little bit first with Todd about how he first got involved with the coalition um, a number of years ago. We're thinking actually, we're guessing 2006, but we might be making that up. <laughs> yes, so I originally uh, inquired at the town, you know, for, to the town about doing medication safety, mm -hmm. uh, doing medication take back events. And um, through that inquiry, got connected with Oasis and then it kind of just went from there, became yep. involved, and that was several years ago. We're trying yes. to figure out the time, yeah. but it's it was been several a while. years yeah. ago. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, and since that time, we've really, we've been doing those take backs regularly, and we'll, we're gonna talk about that in the show in a few minutes. So um, I thought where we could start actually is also sort of back at the beginning and talk a little bit about why Oasis as a coalition here in Stoughton has been talking about medication safety really since um, the coalition started. Um, and so before the show, Todd and I talked a little bit about this and um, we were remembering that um, when the coalition was originally founded back in 2004, there, um, there was a lot going on in the media and uh, both locally in Massachusetts and across the country related to OxyContin. Um, and so the, the country was really talking a lot about sort of this opiate crisis and OxyContin was um, at the start of that. And then locally, what happened is we, um, we unfortunately had an incident at the high school where we had a young woman who um, sort of didn't fit what people I think thought were kind of traditionally what one would expect for somebody who was using um, or abusing opiates have um, an incident at the high school, and then there were some other incidents locally in the news where we were um, you know, really finding young people were having interactions with the police department in local emergency rooms. And so in that um, context, the Department of Public Health actually put out some money and some planning grants for communities to address opiates and heroin specifically. It was actually a heroin planning grant. Um, and the coalition uh, sort of was founded around writing and then receiving that grant and then getting some money to do um, ultimately some implementation work related to that and um, and then wrote for some bigger federal dollars and sort of that kind of propelled us to where we are today. So um, I know Todd, you were, you've been in the field for a long time and so you remember a little bit about sort of what other things we were talking about when OxyContin kind of came on the market like that and was causing all kinds of issues? Sure, well, so, um, so uh, use of prescriptions, particularly opiate prescriptions, mm -hmm. uh, has been an issue for some time. And originally, when the opiate crisis started, that was really the thing that propelled it, mm -hmm. that people were using uh, prescriptions inappropriately. Um, and so the focus there was to reduce that. And so there were several strategies that were implemented from you know getting the medication out of patients' houses mm -hmm. um, when they didn't need it anymore, to uh, reducing prescribing, mm -hmm. to uh, more monitoring of the prescriptions uh, through the prescription drug monitoring program. So there were a number of strategies implemented t designed to decrease inappropriate access to opiate and other medications of abuse. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, and we know since opiate use, kind of like other um, drug abuse is complicated, it's sort of a societal issue with lots of layers, there were a number of strategies sort of coming at this from all different angles. So like you were talking about from sort of the prescribing angle um, and, you know, as a coalition, we think more about the side of, um, you know, reducing the students, uh, you know, for us, we we're talking mostly about adolescents, um, you know, their desire to use these drugs in the first place. So, yeah, you know. We, we know for adolescents, um, many times their initial exposure to opiates and abusing opiates comes from their own house, from mm -hmm. the medicine cabinet. And so because we are mostly focused on, on minors um, and adolescents, uh, our focus has really been on uh, reducing access 
uh, getting the products eliminated, mm -hmm. removed from the house as soon as possible. Right, right. And so um, I know we have, we actually, we've been monitoring our data for a long time. So maybe we can pull up that slide that shows sort of where we've been with, um, in terms of prescription drug abuse and students. Um, here it is. So this is sort of our current, this is the landscape right now. And we think about student high school students in comparison to the state of Massachusetts. And we look at prescription drugs in relation to other drugs that um, students may have experimented with. And we know now that fortunately, this is a drug that is not um, really abused by high school students. It's serious, it's significant um, when it does happen, but um, compared to other things that we are also concerned about as a coalition, it is um, fortunately at the lower end of the scale. Um, I'm wondering if we have the one that shows where the trajectory of um, what drug use, yes, this one. Um, and so you can also sort of see here at the bottom line, that green line shows really how far we've come in terms of reducing uh, prescription drug use in sort of what we consider to be current use among high school students over the years as we've been doing this work together. Um, and really it's pretty negligible at this point at the high school, which is great news. Um, you know, any amount is concerning, of course. But I think we can credit Oasis for keeping that um, kind of in the forefront mm -hmm. and focusing on, the, focusing on that and giving the community the tools that they need mm -hmm. to address those issues. So, yep. so it's something we want to continue to do, absolutely. But, we've, but we've been doing what we think is a pretty good job so right, far. Right, right. So I think what, it's nice to be able to see that success and know that it's something that is really important. I mean, also knowing that in, you know, in our community, of course, our community is made up of not just adolescents, but adults and um, and sort of that once our students leave the high school, it's harder for us to monitor what's happening with them because um, it's really easy to survey students when they are under the roof of one building. Um, and when they when they leave that environment, um, you know, we want to make sure that they their risk of going on to using some of these other things is as low as possible. Um, you know, and but we certainly know that as we look at some of the data that talks about adults in our community, that these are still issues of concern, both opiates and heroin. Um, you know, so we, we want to make sure we're continuing to share with folks the strategies that work and, um, and the work that we're continuing to do to protect our young people and as they grow up and are in this community and, um, and also what we're doing for adults. So um, let's talk a little bit about how this issue has changed. So Todd, you alluded to the prescription drug monitoring system and prescribing practices. Can you talk a little bit about how those look a little different now than they did when we first started talking about this? Right, so we've really clamped down on the prescribing of these medications. Uh, the quantity has been dramatically reduced from, uh, for a lot of these medications, whether patients are going to the ER because they have an acute problem or whether they're seeing their primary care doctor or someone else or after surgery. Mm -hmm. In all these cases, prescribers have really clamped down on the number of these medications that are prescribed and there's a lot of discussion in the medical community about what are the appropriate amounts that should be prescribed mm -hmm. in certain circumstances. And then the prescription monitoring program tracks those, uh, those prescriptions and so they can see uh, through analysis where, um, where, there might not, where there might need to be additional interventions mm -hmm. uh, to reduce prescribing. Um, and so those things um, altogether have really reduced the amount of opiates that are prescribed to patients. Mm -hmm. So what's nice about that is what we hope for is that there are less of these things sort of in the environment in general. They're not as frequent in people's medicine cabinets and we've done a lot of work too around making sure once people are done with their medications they're appropriately disposing of them um, which is a you know, as you said earlier, one of the key ways, unfortunately, that young people maybe get exposed to these things are through excess medications in people's medicine cabinets. Correct. Right. Um, so what are some of the ways that folks can sort of address this in their own home? So those are some of the bigger kind of global things that the state is doing to, um, you know, really be working with patients and communities to, to reduce the amount of these things. But what are some things that adults can do in their own, sort of under their own roof that they have control over to reduce the likelihood of somebody either accidentally, um, you know, getting too much of a medicine or, you know, maybe not accidentally. Well, we do a medication safety program for second graders. Yep. Um, and the four uh, main 
issues or main points that we address on that is number one, to keep medications in their original container. Mm -hmm. Number two, keep them in a safe place. Number three, we tell young children to only accept medication from a trusted adult. And then number four, never share medication. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think those, those items can apply to a larger group, um, you know, keeping medications in a safe place, keeping them out of reach of children, mm -hmm. um, doing everything we can to keep them, uh, keep unintended people from getting access to them. I think that would apply across the board. Mm -hmm. And then the other uh, big strategy that people can use to reduce access to these medications is disposing of them as soon as they don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. So instead of letting them stay around the house, uh, getting rid of them as quickly as possible. Uh, there's a couple of different ways people can get rid of medication. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can mix them with their trash, kitty litter, coffee brown, coffee grounds, and then throw them in their trash. Mm -hmm. That's one option. Yep. They can flush them down their toilet or they can bring them to either the police station or our medication take back events mm -hmm. uh, for them to be incinerated. And so bring them to the police station or bring them to a drug take back event is the most environmentally friendly option mm -hmm. because they're incinerated and they don't go back into the, into the groundwater. Mm -hmm. um, and so we recommend that for the medications that have the highest abuse potential. Mm -hmm. Opiate medications, uh, if the prescription says federal law prohibits the transfer of this medicine, yep. then it has an ab a increased abuse potential. And so we recommend to people to get them out of the house or get rid of them as quickly as possible. And so the preferred me method would be uh, bringing them to the police station, but if people aren't going to be able to do that right away because they're busy, then the second method is either flushing them down the toilet or putting them in the garbage mm -hmm. with coffee grounds or kitty litter or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, for the other category of medications that have less abuse potential, um, we can wait and put and bring them to a take back event or um, bring them to the police station mm -hmm. because there's not so much concern yep. around them. But for the group of medications that have a higher abuse potential, we want to get rid of them as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things too for people to remember, there are some restrictions about what can go in that box at the police station, right? So liquids, no liquids, lotions, oh, um, very, you know, inhalers, aerosol cans, needles, none of those things can go into the um, take back box that's at the police station because it will create um, either a hazard for the officers who have to empty that box or a mess. Um, honestly, I, I think sometimes when liquids get in there, it, it turns everything that's in the box into a giant congealed ball of yuck, I guess, right? You're right. Um, so that's really important. This is a picture of the box. Um, what's nice about our take back box is that because it's in the lobby of the police department, it means it is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, it basically it functions like a mailbox. You can open it. You don't have to talk to anybody. Um, you can put the medicines right in there. You folks um, can actually put. You can dump the pills into like a Ziploc bag and put that bag into the box, so it removes any identifying information from the pill bottles. Then you can even recycle those bottles if they're recyclable. Um, so that that's nice as well. But knowing that all anything that goes into that box ultimately does get incinerated. So even if there was still identifying information on any of the containers, you don't really have to worry about that getting into anybody's hands who's um, going to be looking at those labels. Really, that ultimately is um, being collected by the police, and they are delivering it up to Covanta, which is a medical waste disposal facility that then safely incinerates all those medications. Right, and the other change is that now in the police station, people can drop off used needles and syringes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, so yep, that is the see. box right there in the picture, um, which is so it's next to the medication safety disposal box. That box used to be over at the fire department, um, but it's now in the lobby of the police department. So that's also available 24 hours a day. You know, sometimes it's challenging for folks who um, regularly need needles for diabetes management or other things to figure out where to safely dispose of those things. So um, the needles really, they're supposed to be contained in a sharps box, um, not just sort of thrown haphazardly into the 
um, into that box itself. But if you don't have a Sharps container box, you can also use things like um, a laundry detergent, plastic bottle, or some other thing that is sort of a hard plastic that can be capped, and then those can be safely disposed of. Or um, you can dispose of any of those containers that you might have on Hazardous Waste Day, which is this year will happen in Stoughton in the spring. But this is a big advantage. Now you can go to the police station right. and dispose of not only your unneeded medication, but you used sharps, needles, and syringes. Correct. So I think that, that that's nice that the town that's is great. able to yes. offer that. Not every community has that exactly. um, in their community. And um, so we're, we're fortunate and we should take advantage of those things and you know let people know that they're there because I think sometimes people don't even realize that that is an option that's available. So let's talk a little bit about other strategies that um, the coalition has put into place. So we do really encourage people to use that box. Getting those medications out of your household is really important. And, um, you know, so saving them for a rainy day, not such a great idea, right? So particularly those medications that have a higher abuse potential. Mm -hmm. So the pain medications, yep. the medications that have that little statement, federal law prohibits a transfer of this mm -hmm. prescription. Those have higher abuse potential, and so we want those to be disposed of as quickly as possible. Okay. So if people aren't going to bring them right away to the police mm -hmm. station, they can flush them down the toilet or they can put them in their trash. Right. So don't save your knee surgery medicine okay. for a rainy day. That stuff should go away. If you need another prescription, that's something that you should be having a conversation with your doctor. Right. And the reason for that is we know that young people, the most likely method of access to mm -hmm. these medications is from the house directly. And so if we leave them in the house, we're increasing the possibility of access, as well as if we have visitors mm -hmm. that might try to access this medication. And so for that small category of medication that has a higher risk, uh, we want to emphasize to get rid of those as soon as possible, either bring them to the police station, disposing them in the trash, or flushing them down the toilet. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so we talked a little bit about that second grade med safety program, and we, we shared what those four principles are that we teach the students. Do you want to say a little bit more about why, why we are working with second graders and sort of what the bigger picture is for that strategy? Uh, so we want to, uh, to educate our, our adolescents and younger people as soon as possible. We know that if they get into the habit of handling medication correctly, they're less likely to abuse them. Mm -hmm. We know that the longer we delay access to, to these medications, that, um, adolescents who don't start on these medications until later, they have better outcomes. So there's a lot of data to show that, uh, that any, um, anything we can do for our youth to delay their access or to delay first use of these medications uh, greatly enhances the outcomes for mm -hmm. these people. Yep. So we sort of, and we hope that over time we're going to reach most Stoughton families if we continue to work with second graders. Um, you know, all the materials go home, kids bring, you know, second graders still are sort of sharing all kinds of things with their parents. They get a lovely magnet that goes on their fridge that reminds them of the four medication principles. And, um, and what's been really nice about this program too is in addition to collaborating with the school department, we also collaborate with the police department and the school resource officers come in and, and talk to the students. So when the students aren't distracted by wondering what else other interesting things police officers do during the day, um, you know, they're able to also participate and reinforce some of these principles with our second graders. And, um, and so that's been, it's been fun and you know, an important piece of work that we've been doing for a number of years now. Yeah, it's a fun event. It's good to collaborate with a number of different departments, mm -hmm. um, and it's always enjoyable. The, the, the students are always very uh, engaging and, mm -hmm. and really like it. Yep, yeah, it's, been, it's really a great program. We play games with them. Mm -hmm. They get to ask all sorts of questions <laughs> that- Full of questions. Full of <laughs> questions. Um, and so that's, that's been a great strategy. Um, we've done a lot of education and marketing around that Dropbox, as we talked about. Um, one year with a grant that we had, we got a little creative when we made uh, medication safety envelopes that included all sorts of information. And then we found out that so many people were using the envelopes that it was clogging the Dropbox, so, um, which I guess was a little bit of a good problem to have, but we, we don't really want the box clogged. We want people using it and for it to be able to be emptied. Um, but we're always trying to think about creative ways to get that information out there. Right. We've, um, we have visited the local pharmacies, mm -hmm. and some of them have um, have distributed distributed medication 
uh, information on how to dispose of medication, um, and we still do the uh, the prescription drug take back events mm -hmm. at the uh, hazardous waste day, and we'll continue to do those. Right. And so we kind of have a multifaceted strategy uh, to help the Stoughton community deal with disposing of prescription mm -hmm. drugs. Yep. Um, it, you know, and I think another piece to this that is important is um, we have been collaborating also with the district attorney's office around some of these strategies for a number of years. This is um, an important issue for the county because one of the, um, unfortunately, the major causes of death in our county is due to drug overdose. And so the um, the district attorney's office was actually the office that initially purchased the drop boxes for our police departments across the county, which is why in Norfolk, I think you see them in every police department at this point, which is really fantastic. And they continue to do a lot of data gathering and really looking at this issue from their end. Um, and our police department also does a lot of work on this issue by ensuring that um, Narcan is available to all of our police officers. And in fact, we were the first police department in the Commonwealth to do this independent of um, a pilot program the Department of Public Health was doing for a number of years. And so that's something that we're really proud of here in Stoughton. Um, and it means that you know, in the event of an opiate overdose, our police department, as well as our fire department, are very well equipped to address this issue um, you know, during that emergency because we really wanna make sure that you know, we're really we're helping folks who are sort of struggling with this issue. Addiction is, um, particularly open addiction, is very serious and significant for some families. And and we really we know we can't help people if we aren't able to keep them with us. So that Narcan piece is actually very very important. The police department also does some outreach to families following an overdose, where they really make sure that all of the resources that are available to families for both supporting of the family but treatment are available as well because we really we don't want individuals to be in that position it's um it's frightening it's very dangerous and so that's why we really were focused on that prevention work but we also have resources in place in our community um you know really make sure we're supporting those families that are are struggling with this issue currently right and i should also point out that any individual can go to their local pharmacy mm -hmm. and ask for naloxone and the pharmacy can provide it without a prescription and bill it to your insurance company mm -hmm. so you'd only have to pay the copay. And so people that are in the situation where they might have a concern about mm -hmm. you know, opiate overdose, uh, they, sh they should really think about having naloxone in the home mm -hmm. in case of an emergency. Right, well, yeah, that's actually a really great point. So for, for those families who you know, feel like this is this might be a concern. Having that the naloxone or Narcan is sort of the trade name for that um, available to be able to intervene in the event of an overdose is is really important. And it's always always really important. I feel like we would be remiss to not say to always call nine one one. So even if you administer Narcan to an individual that's overdosing and are successfully able to reverse that overdose on your own, you, it's really really important to make sure that a medical professional really has eyes on this individual for lots of different reasons. Um, it, even if that immediate emergency appears to be over, it's it's really important. Somebody can relapse back into that overdose. Yeah. There could be other medical issues going on. And so it's really important to have that person evaluated by um, the EMTs and, and probably the hospital as well. Exactly. Yep. yep. So I think that's um, also a really important piece. So as we're sort of coming to the end of our show, we've talked about a lot of things. I wanna make sure that people really know where they can safely um, get rid of their medications that are in their home. So just to sort of reiterate that piece, because I, that's sort of part of um, one of the reasons we are doing this show this year. Uh, National Drug Take Back Day happens every year at the end of October. And so it's always a good time for us to remind people about how to safely dispose. So um, let's talk one more time about in Stoughton, um, what are the ways you can get those medicines out of your house? Okay. So the preferred method is to bring them to the police station and there's a kiosk there where they can drop their prescription medications in. And as we discussed, they can also bring their used needles, syringes, sharps, and put them in the container mm -hmm. that's all right next to the prescription medication. So they can bring them both at the same time and get rid of both their prescription medication as well as their sharps. If they're not gonna be able to make it to the police station immediately, and if they have medications that have a higher abuse potential, pain medications, 
medications that have that do not transfer, federal law prohibits transfer of this medication, then they can either mix it with coffee grounds or kitty litter and dispose of it in their trash or flush it down their toilet. Mm -hmm. Great, right. Um, and so I think, you know, as we continue to look at this issue as a community, as a coalition, it continues to be a significant issue of concern. Unfortunately, we do still have individuals who um, are suffering with addiction related to some of these medications um, or other opiates like heroin. We know we are continuing to struggle with um, overdoses here in Stoughton. We're not immune to that, but certainly as a community, we're doing a lot to address it, which I think is is very important and hopeful. And we know that most of our adolescents are um, really choosing to steer clear of abusing prescription medications or using them recreationally. And so that's, again, really important and really hopeful. Um, it's something we, we definitely want to continue to pay attention to. We, um, you're, you're gonna hear us talk on other episodes about other drugs that, um, the, our use rates are higher among our students and you know we're continuing to do a lot of work around that as well. So this is less of an adolescent issue. However, um, it is really important and we know that the adolescent brain is still developing until the age of 25. Any of these types of drugs, um, whether they're opiates or stimulants or other kinds of prescription medication when not used in the way that they are intended can be really dangerous for kids and can lead to other significant health issues, addiction being one of them. And so it's really important to us as a community to continue to pay attention to this critical issue, but to know that um, you know our kids really, they really do seem to understand this. They're making great choices around these things. They know they're significant and they're serious, um, and that's really good news. Um, but if you're a parent and you're watching this at home, it's really the best thing you can do is to talk to your kids about um, the importance of being safe around medicine, um, the importance of not abusing um, other drugs as well, you know, really protecting their brain. That's one of the things we think about, that growing brain, and getting these things out of your home so there's no temptation and there's um, you know, less risk of something happening accidentally. So um, if you have questions, you can find more information on the OASIS website, which is www stotonoasis.org. You can find us on Facebook as well. Um, we always share lots of these things and um, thank you for tuning in.